Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining for the next in our remote training sessions um, here at MC Squared. So I'm Bobby Kearns. I'm the center manager for the Michigan Center for Materials Characterization. Um, so today we're going to do some basic training on the Nova Nano Lab for SEM only. I'll do some things like eucentric setting of height, uh, but I'm not going to talk a lot about the focused ion beam today. We'll do another training for that. Today is just SEM basic training. If you have any questions, feel free to chat, and I'll be monitoring that during the whole training session. So I will just verbally answer your question. That way, I don't have to type uh, while I'm while I'm operating the microscope. But I should see the question and can answer it. So do feel free to please um, speak up if you have any questions. Let me know, and hopefully, I will be able to answer those for you. So what I'm going to do now is go ahead and switch over to our user interface. Um, what we should be able to see today, hopefully, is the user interface on the left-hand side here, where uh, my mouse is active. Uh, seems like it's kind of jumping around on me. Let me uh, try one thing. I'm just cleaning the mouse here. Hopefully, that helps. One thing I didn't think about. Okay. Um, Hmm. I'm going to try to kill Mouse Without Borders and see if that does it for me. Uh, let's just close it. No, let's exit mouse without borders okay my mouse is behaving way better now so again sorry hopefully sh you should see the UI here uh, we have the hand panels and the top part of the keyboard and then I have another view where I will show the microscope chamber as we load a sample um, so let's go ahead and get started very first thing I'm going to do is vent the chamber if you look in the top right corner, there's a vent button. Obviously, uh, most electron microscopy is a high vacuum process. So to load our sample, we can check and see that we are currently under vacuum. Uh, chamber pressure is about three to the minus six torr. I want to vent, that way I can open the chamber and load my sample. If you arrive and the chamber is not under vacuum, do let staff know, that means something's gone wrong. Um, so let's take a look here at the microscope chamber. So I'm not going to go over uh, a full uh, show and tell of all of the components of the microscope. Today I just want to get you going on electron microscopy. Um, generally as you load the microscope you're going to stand on this side of it and there's an important reason why that I'll, I'll show you in a second. I am going to wear some gloves. It's vital that you always wear gloves when loading or handling anything that's going to go inside an electron microscope. Uh, otherwise we get really bad hydrocarbon contamination and it makes the imaging really poor. So I load my gloves. I've got a sample here that I'm going to use for today's training. So let me see if while we're waiting, uh, the microscope door won't open until it's fully vented. So while we're waiting for that, uh, here's the sample we're going to use. It's a multi-standard sample. Uh, we have some various different areas that, that I'll use today. Your sample generally should be on what we call a Cambridge stub. Uh, Cambridge stub effectively is just a small aluminum table with an eighth inch pin on it. So that's the easiest way to get your sample into our microscope is having it mounted to a Cambridge stub. This appears to be a 25 millimeter stub, so it's about one inch in diameter. Most of them are 10 millimeter stubs, so one centimeter in diameter. So I'm just kind of lightly tugging on the door just to see when vacuum breaks. You don't want to really aggressively pull on it. The door is on linear bearings and we'd like it to smoothly open. That way we don't jar the microscope. 
venting should take at maximum three minutes, three, four minutes. One other tool that you'll need um, is a 1.5 millimeter Allen wrench. You should always find one in the room. We have one in every single room. And if it's not there, please let us know. Uh, one other thing that I'll talk about is we are gonna use a height gauge that we call the elephant. And um, I'll explain exactly how that works as soon as the chamber door opens. Okay, so here is the microscope Door. You see how it operates. It opens on these roller bearings here. Uh, so it is a fairly heavy door. We want to control it as it opens. Don't let it aggressively stop. Uh, otherwise the microscope jars and it can cause some, some issues. One thing I might do just to show you a little better. Uh, I am going to tilt the... Let's see. Let's go here. Um, I'm going to tilt the stage just for demonstration purposes. Let's see if that helps any. Okay, a little bit. So, oops, let's go here. So I've tilted the stage just, just to show the uh, sample holder. It's a cross sample holder that can hold five samples, and there are a number of holes that accept this Cambridge stub. So what we'll do is put the sample into that cross holder and we're going to tighten down a small set screw right here. And I'm just using two fingers. We only need to make electrical contact here. We're not making a mechanical force to really tighten the sample. Uh, that will cause the uh, screw here to strip and become ruined. So we just want to use two fingers, just tighten it up enough to make electrical contact. I'm going to actually remove this sample. I only tilted to demonstrate, so I'm going to go back to zero tilt. And from there, I'll demonstrate how you would normally load the sample. So let's go back to zero. We see the stage tilting back. Okay. So I am going to drop the sample in. Um, I'm going to use my handy dandy white card here so you can kind of see now um, the sample on the stage. Again, I am going to tighten the set screw just with two fingers to make electrical contact. At this point, it is not safe to close the door. I need to verify that my sample will not hit the pole piece. Uh, the electron pull piece is probably the most sensitive and costly part you could damage on this microscope. So to prevent damage, uh, we, we have provided here what we call the elephant. You can see it's got a top notch here and there's a lower notch. What we want to do is put the elephant on the stage and make sure that, oops, let me go to, sorry, wrong side. Make sure that nowhere is my sample above the top of the elephant. Ideally, I want it to be pretty much right underneath the snout. Now, let me come back here to a closer view. And you can see on it, it says, there's a line that says five. Five millimeters is the working distance of the microscope. So if my, it's the optimal working distance. If my sample is under this snout, then I'll be nominally at five millimeter when I close the door. Um, if I'm above the top level, I am guaranteed to damage the microscope. So use this every single time you load the microscope. The lower notch indicates the full Z travel. So the Z travel is 25 millimeters on this. So Z is up and down. If my sample, when I load it, is below this notch, I will not be able to move up enough to reach five millimeter. So when you load the sample, make sure it's above the lower notch, below the upper notch, and you're safe. At no point should any part of your sample be above the top of the elephant. One other point 
I should make is that if you load multiple samples, make sure they do not differ in size by say more than the thickness of a penny. If you do, when you translate X and Y around the stage and one sample is higher than the other, you can easily damage the pull piece. So at this point, I have my sample at the appropriate height. I just happen to be there, but what if you're not? So what I want to show is the way that this sample holder operates. This is a two-part uh, stage accessory. Uh, we generally refer to it as the cone and post or the cone and cross. What I want to do is remove it all the way, take it a little closer so you can see. So we have a cone that effectively is a nut that as I tighten or loosen it, it moves up and down. We set the height of this accessory by screwing the main post in and then I'm going to use the cone as a lock nut to lock it in place. So we put it into the stage. And again, I'm going to use the elephant right now. The sample is above the elephant, so way too high. Let me use this hand. So I'm going to lower by spinning this post. Check. Okay, so I'm just under that notch. Uh, let me use my, my board here so you can see a little bit better. Uh, the sample clears the notch, so that's in a good Z position. What I need to do now is move this cone to lock the post in position. So you see now I'm going to screw this down into place. I don't know if you noticed, I gave it a little bit of a wiggle just to make sure that everything is in place there. And there's a base here that when I tighten, I want to make sure that base, I hold that static. That way I don't uh, crank and ruin the stage mechanism. So we screw the post in and out to move the sample up or down. We use the cone to lock the post in place all while holding on to the stage base so as not to damage it. One final time, check with the elephant. I'm happy, pull that out. Now it's time to close the door and pump the chamber down. Let's go back to this view. In the bottom left, or sorry, bottom right here, you'll see an interior camera view. This, this conical piece at the top is that electron pole piece that I mentioned. What we want to do is, as you close the door, uh, you, you may be standing across the room, don't just close the door without watching. You must watch this camera view. And you can tell I'm closing pretty slow. Again, I don't want to slam the door. So, as we close the door, I watch in that camera view. It's now time to pump down. I don't want to just be hands off the microscope at this point. I leave one hand on the door, and we're going to go here to the beam control page and click pump. If the door were to roll open while I click pump, it will just continually suck air room in through the microscope and not come to vacuum. I only need to hold my hand here long enough that atmospheric pressure has closed the door. So I can give this a little tug. It's not opening. I, I now no longer need to hold the microscope. Uh, I am also at this point going to take my gloves off because I, I don't want to operate the microscope with gloves on. Okay. So we have the sample loaded into the chamber. We've safely closed the door. We began pumping to high vacuum. What we're waiting on is right here. This icon should become green when the pressure is okay. We'll see a readout eventually. As the pressure lowers enough, a gauge will turn on. Uh, here is where we will see that readout.
This should take between three to five minutes. If it takes any longer, maybe something's gone wrong and you should come get staff. At times, we get fibers across the door o-ring or just dirt, and we can clean that for you. While I'm waiting, what I want to do is just talk a little bit about some of the terms I'll use. These I will refer to as drop-down menus. There are a number of normal use functions that are here and what I will refer to as the toolbar. And then over on the right hand side, we have control panels. And you can see the different tabs will change to different control panels. For the purposes of today, 90% of what we will do is here. If I hover, let's see if I can get it to pop up. Uh, no, let me click off of it and now hover. It's the beam control navigation panel control panel there is also click off of it and hover no, this is the navigation yeah there it goes navigation control panel patterning is for fib we're not going to really use that today but I may use the processing panel to do some measurements 90% will be here uh, again we're waiting the, you can see that there are multiple quadrants in the user interface, one being the CCD camera. The CCD camera is the chamber cam. Um, each quadrant can have a different view. We can attach a different detector to it at times. And we can also control which beam is controlled by each quadrant. Standard operation is to have the top left quadrant an electron beam quadrant, top right an ion beam quadrant. You are able to change these though. So just keep in mind this is a multi-user lab. If you come in and it's not configured the way that you're used to, know how to change these. Um, all of the quadrants can also be made full screen. If we select a quadrant you see here the, the data bar becomes blue. Normally it is gray if it's deselected. So I'm going to select the CCD, I can press F5, uh, you saw here on the toolbar, and this is now a full screen view. Because we're doing SEM only, we will mainly do single screen view with the electron beam quadrant. One interesting thing to note is that as I change quadrants, you'll see the control panel changes function a little bit. This icon, this little uh, bore atom, with the electron shells means that we're controlling the electron beam. If I change and I've got this nucleus, it means that we're controlling the ion beam. So that's an indication as well. Um, whether when you change an attribute, it's changing the intended beam. When you're in the room, you can hear the turbo pump spin up. So I, I do hear that it's starting to get a little bit quieter. So we, we soon should be in a good place. So uh, Jeremy asks if there is an auto script that automates the FIB lift out process. We do. We have a script called AutoTem. Uh, we actually have that on our FEI Helios, our Thermo Plasma FIB, and the Nova here. Uh, it, it's a more sophisticated script on the Helios and Plasma FIB, so you'll have better results there, but we do have it available here on the Nova. I'm actually, I'm not really gonna um, use it today. Uh, let's, let's verify if we look at programs. Oh, real quick, you can see the vacuum is reading. We're at 2.9 to the minus five tour. Let's see, we say FEI company applications, user tools, I don't see it. So uh, I, I know that we actually should have it. It just means it's not been reinstalled since since we last had a software up upgrade. Okay, so the icon is green, we're good to go. At this point, the vacuum will continue down. 2.5 minus five tour is not as good as it's gonna get, but we can begin working at this point. What I wanna do is activate a quadrant for the beam I intend to use, which for today is the electron beam. And I'm gonna click this button that says beam on. When you're in the room, maybe you heard it over my mic there's a, a clicking sound of the column vacuum opening. So we click the beam on. And now, so far we don't see anything. And the reason is that we're not scanning the beam. We always need to unpause the beam scanning. 
at the beginning. So I click on pause and now suddenly we see, if I change the contrast and brightness with the knob here, we can, we can see this uh, frame moving. I am going to go ahead and, and press F5 and take this to single screen. Another thing I can do is uh, window and click this button that says single slash quad image. One thing you'll find with the FEI tools, there's like three different ways to do almost every function. Uh, I usually use the F5 key. So here, let me go ahead and just talk through a little bit about the toolbar. We can set magnification by selecting here. We can also change magnification with the center knob of the MUI. Uh, the MUI we refer to as the manual user interface, MUI, so it's the MUI. I also have an option of pressing plus and minus on the keyboard, so I'm actually, I have to press the numpad, the plus and minus on the, the number row doesn't work. What that will do for me is you see this reported magnification, plus gives me twice the magnification I was at, Okay, so we can also set our beam parameters, 5 kV, 400 picoamp. There are some beam alignments I'm going to use. I'm going to talk about these five icons, six icons a little bit later. What I want to get to now is the scan speed. The scan speed controls how fast the refresh rate is. I've gone to a slower scan speed, and if I hover, it says the frame time 4.7 minutes. That's how long it takes for this entire frame to refresh. To start, I'm going to scan fast. That way we can easily focus, find our sample. Just happen to know this is the edge of the stub. I'm going to press a keystroke, uh, control zero. Let me click here. You see that my X position is minus 20 millimeter, Y is one millimeter. When I press control zero, it's gonna to go to the zero zero position of the stage. Obviously my image was very saturated there, so I can turn down the contrast, turn down the brightness, uh, so that's these two knobs here. I can also do the same thing with the sliders at the bottom of the control panel. I come back to the beam control panel, you see contrast and brightness is still there. Changing the knob does change the number. I'm not clicking, I'm just turning the knob and the number changes. So what I'm, what I'm interested in doing now is just generally finding our area of interest. This happens to be a platinum aperture and not what we're going to look at right now. I'm driving the stage around. I'm going to I'm going to give some pointers on how I do that a little bit later. Uh, right now, I'm most interested in finding my region of interest, and that's going to be this sample here. This is a 10 sphere sample. Uh, also, just so you know, um, you see this this gray region. We actually are scanning a little bit on the inside of the pull piece. So at the lowest magnifications, you can see the pull piece. Um, just FYI. So our beam alignments are not good right now. We have a lot of work to do to get a good image. I can slow down the scan a little bit. And so what I've done so far is I have loaded the sample. We pump down to high vacuum. As soon as this icon turned green, I can turn the beam on. I then had to unpause scanning, which is done here with this pause icon. I can also press F6 to pause and unpause scanning. And now I've moved around to find a region of interest. My next task is to move the sample to five millimeter working distance. With an electron microscope, I can work really at any working distance, but every vendor makes an optimal working distance. In the case of the Nova, that optimal working distance is five millimeter. It is not okay for me 
to just come to the Z and type in five. I'm almost guaranteed to damage the sample or damage the microscope if I do that. So instead what I'm going to do is link the working distance. So let me come back to full screen. If I hover here, you see this says link Z to FWD. Uh, FWD just means, some people call it forward working distance. I've heard it called free working distance. Working distance is the focal point of the electron beam with, with the bottom of the lens being the frame of reference. So if I turn this focus knob here, you see the image gets very blurry and my working distance says 500 micron. That means my electron crossover is here and the beam is then diverging quite a bit. Okay, I go through focus, I see it get not great, but I go through focus uh, and then suddenly it gets way worse. So what I wanna do is go, uh, I'm gonna go counterclockwise through focus, now I turn the knob back clockwise. I'm gonna make smaller and smaller movements until I converge on what I think is the best focus. And you notice as I turn the knob, this working distance value changes. This image is a poor image because our beam alignments are not done yet. But at this point, this is the best focus we can be at. 7.2 millimeter working distance means my Sample surface is 7.2 millimeters from the bottom of this lens. And the reason why, you know, I look at this, okay, that's a terrible image, right? I agree. But if I turn the knob left, it gets worse. If I turn the knob right, it gets worse. So I've converged on what is going to be considered for right now the best focus. So I can go ahead and click this link Z to working distance. Only click that button when you've verified focus. Now it is safe. Let me go to F5 here. Now it is safe for me to type 5.0 into the Z height. And what we're going to see is the sample is going to move up. And you see it moves up quickly. So if you mess that step up, you might damage the microscope. I'm going to go a little higher in magnification. So again, we are going to converge on a focal point. Here's not good. I've gone through focus. Okay, here's probably about as good as it's going to get. I need to do a number of things. So I have to do my crossover alignment. I have to do my lens alignment. And I have to correct for astigmatism. So first is easiest. I just click crossover. And now this 2D control panel will move this white disc and I simply center the white disc around the green cross. The green cross represents the center of the optic axis. The white disc is actually, we've, we've kind of effectively flipped the image and found a way to image the emission point. So now we've centered the emission on the optic axis. So source tilt, super easy, should take you five seconds. Uh, let me show what happens if it's off. Clearly, if the beam is off axis, I can see nothing. So if you come in and turn the beam on and you can't find any image, that should trigger you to do your crossover alignment. Uh, let's see if I can, uh, I'll, I'll do that later. Okay, so we're, we're centered around the crossover here. Going to uncheck. One thing you may notice is when I focus, the image is really stretching. Now, uh, I think is my camera, yeah. So now it's stretched in this direction. As I go through focus, we're now stretched, sorry, my camera inverts. We're now in this direction. Um, this tells me I have astigmatism, and I also am seeing some swinging in the image when I focus. Swinging is a function of lens alignment, and the stretching as I go through focus is a function of the stigmator. 
Just looking at this, I can tell whoever used this last um, left the beam not in a great position. The stigmator is all the way over on the right. I'm going to make it easy on myself. I'm going to right click here and I'm going to say zero. Oh, look at that. Magically, it got way better. Um, the last user could have had a magnetic sample that really skewed astigmatism. Who knows? But this is a multi-user lab. You have to be prepared for when the last user leaves the beam in a horrible condition. So I'm going to start, just right click in the middle of that box and say zero. Uh, you can also see these knobs here control astigmatism, right? So if I turn this one, this is the x-axis, and now this control panel will be nominally centered. Okay. I'm going to take a little detour to talk about stage movement at this point. I have a number of ways to move the stage. So I can, as long as I've selected here, something's interesting happening. I can see my mic redlining, so hopefully you guys can hear me okay. Uh, I'm not sure what's causing that. But, um, so stage movement. The arrow keys on the keyboard will move one whole field of view in an orthogonal direction. I'm right now, can't really see it, uh, maybe, yeah. So I'm using the arrow keys on the keyboard, moving the stage in one full field of view, or nearly one field of view. Uh, if we look at this particle, if I move up, that particle is now at the bottom. And we can see these numbers changing. I'm pressing just the right arrow and only the x-axis is changing. Now I press, press the down arrow, only the y-axis is changing. That's one way to move the stage. Another way to move the stage on these tools is to double click on a feature you like. If I decide, you know what, I really like this particle here. When I double click, it is now nominally centered around this yellow cross within the top. This little tiny guy on top of that one, I can double click and it will move the stage. The double click function, uh, actually you can't see my finger there, is, is related to the data bar though. So if you are really out of focus when you first start your session, double clicking doesn't work well. But you can use it on large scale as well. As you change the magnification, the amplitude of these stage moves changes. Um, let me check something real quick. Hmm. Okay. Just checking my, my audio filters because uh, I can see the audio feed and it looks like it's really, um, really loud. So one other way to move the stage is, can my mouse reach that far? No. Um, okay. Nope, can't reach that far. Okay. The center mouse wheel. If I'm hovering over, mouse go. Okay, one second. Technical difficulties. Okay, is my mouse back? There's a possibility my mouse just died. Um, okay, I have one right here though.
Oops, I accidentally moved my face there. Okay. Aha, okay, so I've got a mouse again. Yay. Uh, one thing you can count on in microscopy is that you can't really count on anything. And today the mouse died, uh, but that's okay. So what we were talking about is stage movement. Um, and now I actually have a little bit more um, mouse cable. So using the mouse wheel, if I press the mouse wheel, you see that the cursor becomes a yellow circle. This puts us into a kind of a joystick mode where now wherever I click, as I drag away from that area, you can see a yellow arrow and I'm moving in the direction of the arrow. The farther I get away from that yellow dot, the larger the, the distance between dot and uh, circle there, the faster my stage moves. So you see if I just barely move it, stage moves pretty slow. So for my personal preference, if I'm gonna use the joystick mode, I always put the mouse right here in the center. So that way I have a pretty linear response. I see a lot of times people use the joystick mode and they put it on the edge and it goes really fast left and then really slow right. So my personal preference, if you're gonna use this mode, just uh, click with the mouse wheel. So pressing the mouse wheel anywhere in the middle. Um, and actually let me, speed up the scanning a little bit, and again, so we can see we're kind of driving around like a joystick. So three ways to move the stage. We can double click, double left click with the mouse on a feature we like. Like if I see this dark feature here, double click, it will become centered. Second is I can press the arrow keys to move an orthogonal field of view. And then finally, I can use what we refer to as joystick mode, press with the mouse wheel in the center of the screen and drive around. And like I said, you, one thing you can count on is that you can't really count on anything. So one final way to, to move, uh, let me actually put it here. We do have some stage knobs right here. So I can just turn the knob on the stage. We have X, Y, rotate, and Z. I'm not gonna rotate in Z right now. I will do that in a moment. But uh, someday you may come to the, the lab late at night, be the only one here, and you find that the mouse movements aren't working for something, for some reason things are um, malfunctioning. You can always use the knobs to move. Okay. So that was stage movement. So I can now look at my image. Let's slow down the refresh rate so that we get a better signal to noise ratio. And here I can see, yeah, I still don't have a great image. And the reason is the astigmatism, uh, astigmation. So right now, everything is stretched in the vertical axis. I go through focus, and everything is stretched in the horizontal axis. So what exactly is happening there is that we want our beam to be a nice circle, but it's actually an ellipse right now. And as we go through focus, the ellipse rotates. Um, so thankfully, we have this x and y knob here. Correcting for astigmatism is the number one issue that people have on the microscope as beginning users. Uh, maybe it just doesn't, it's not quite intuitive, but eventually it, it becomes simple. You should correct astigmatism every time you use the microscope, even if just for practice. Um, you can see at really low mag, okay, this looks all right, because the astigmatism is smaller than my pixel. But we don't want to limit ourselves to really low mags. We want to push the limits. So. I go through focus, and now at this point I'm going to correct the astigmatism. I'm going to do one axis at a time. Let me select the control panel here, and so you can see the, the um, control table. As I, as I turn the Y knob, almost like focusing, the image gets worse. 
let me do this real quick. So we have a comparison. I'm going to acquire an image. Okay, crackling sound. Thanks, Jeremy. I don't know. Let me try something real quick. Um, so I will be right back. I'm going to grab a different microphone. Okay, uh, hopefully you guys can hear me now. So I've, I've switched microphones. I, I have a wireless mic and something was causing uh, some sort of interference there. Got the filters and now I get just a little. Hello, testing, great, okay. Okay, so now, um, what I wanted to do was acquire an image so that we have a comparison. So we're gonna see two identical images here. Once I select the same detector, this one is in BSE mode. We want to go to um, ETD in secondary electron mode. Okay, so we now have what should be the same image. So here is our, our best focus, the best we can do. I'm gonna just pause, oops. Let's just do a single scan, great. Let's come back here. And now I'm gonna correct for the astigmatism. So again, I'm gonna use the x-axis or y-axis first, doesn't really matter. Um, so just like focus, we've made the image worse. Let's go back the other way. We go through, oh, it looks like it's getting worse there. So I'm going to, just like when I focus, I'm going to iterate back and forth until I converge on what seems to be the best area. Now let's do the other axis. And oh wow, that got way better. So I, I'm still going to go through focus, or through the astigmatism point. It gets worse. And now it's a little bit better. Check X one more time. And check Y one more time. Okay, so now let's look at the comparison of a um, image with the astigmatism corrected versus an image with the astigmatism uncorrected. And if you look at it, uh, if you remember, we just zeroed. We simply zeroed the stigmator. We're not very far off zero here. So small corrections of astigmatism can have a big effect. Um, so every time you run the electron microscope, you should focus and then correct for astigmatism. Now finally, what I'm going to do, um, honestly, let's cheat a little bit. I'm going to make this bad so you can see what it looks like. When I focus, my image should just pulse in and out of focus concentrically around the center of the image. What you see now is a little bit of a swinging. I need to get rid of that to have the best focused image because we really want to go as high magnification as we can right now. So I'm going to click this lens align button. And again, let me just sort of cheat by making it really dramatically bad so you can see. So right now the image is swinging side to side. Effectively what's happening is the electron beam, so if this is the, the lens field, the electron beam is over here. So when you focus, it's swinging. If the electron beam is centered, when you focus, it will just concentrically um, move the pivot point up and down. 
So just like astigmatism, this is a two axis correction. I'm gonna click here. And what I'm doing is I've clicked just on this line so that I'm moving only the horizontal and I'm trying to get rid of side to side movement. And that looks better, great. So at this point, let's go even higher in magnification, do a fine focus. So you can see me turning. There are two knobs. The, the wording is kind of rubbed off a little bit. You may see coarse here, fine here. So fine just does bigger jumps. Or sorry, coarse does bigger jumps than fine is what I meant to say. Okay, so that looks like the best focus. You can see we're at 70,000 times magnification. Not a bad image. Um, our contrast and brightness is sort of okay. Uh, what I'm gonna do now is show you how I'm gonna set that. I'm gonna use for, I don't use this every time, your brain eventually just gets calibrated for brightness and contrast, but right now I'm gonna use what we call the video scope. So I press F3, or I can click this button here, turn on the video scope. Let me slow down the scanning quite a bit. What you're seeing is the gray scale. So bottom represents black, top represents white. You're seeing the grayscale distribution along the scan front. So as the scan moves, uh, we can see the distribution. Contrast is gonna change the amplitude of that waveform. So now I have a low contrast image and you can see the amplitude of that waveform is really low. Brightness is an additive function. Brightness will move that waveform up and down. So contrast is multiplicative, it's gain. Brightness is additive. And I actually am controlling analog voltages on the detector when I turn these knobs. If I have my contrast too high, you can see the values uh, cross this dotted line up at the top and where they do, we saturate. So. For a good image in electron microscopy, and sometimes you can't totally avoid it, especially on these round samples that have perfectly vertical edges at some point, but I aim to occupy the kind of 20% to 80% region. So now it's funny, if I look at this, my brain tells me this is a, a lower contrast image than when we first started. But this is an appropriate contrast for electron microscopy. Because I can now take this image to image J, Photoshop if I need to, and I can adjust the contrast and brightness there, but I've, I've still retained information in some of these bright regions. If I take an image that my brain might like, and our brain likes just high contrast, I'm losing all of this data, and if I go to Photoshop or ImageJ, I can't get it back. So I want to, with the gain, change the amplitude of this waveform to occupy between the 80 to 20% region, and Yes, it may look lower contrast, but this is actually a very appropriate brightness and contrast setting. Um, let me do this real quick. Um, notepad, I like to, uh, no, I don't want Adobe Reader, what happened? Let's do this. I think there's an odd function in FEI Lab Notes. Yep, this just opens the Windows Note, not Movie Creator, sorry. Yes, please close. Tools, lab notes. This is just Windows Notepad. Um, so I'm gonna take a second to look at what we've done. So first, obvious, uh, we've logged into FOM and began our reservation. Then we uh, vented the microscope. We put on gloves. We loaded our sample. 
and we check the height with the elephant gauge and let me word wrap. Okay. Once the height was okay, five, close the door and pumped to high vac. After high vac was uh, requirements were met, the icon turns green, and then we, sorry, turned the e-beam on, found our region of interest. At that point, we did a course focus to link the Z to working distance. We moved the stage to uh, five millimeters. And at, at that point, our, our sample's at the appropriate height. So we can start to pay attention to beam alignments and find focus. First step was we adjusted the crossover. After adjusting the crossover, I did a little bit of fine focus and stigmation correction. And this is an iterative thing. So sometimes the stigmation is so bad that you have to focus, stigmate, focus, stigmate a couple times until you really converge. And then we did our lens alignment, which that got rid of the swinging in the image. 13, and then we redo step 11. So after the lens alignment, because stigmation, sources of stigmation are point sources, if we move the beam, we're moving closer or farther away from a point source of stigmation, so we need to check it again. Uh, so we did that. At this point, our sample is at the appropriate height. The beam is aligned. We are ready to take an image. Before taking an image, we uh, set contrast and brightness. And then finally, we're going to take an image. Okay, let's take an image. To take an image, the easiest thing to do is you just press F2. Um, so I pressed F2 here on the keyboard. It's done a single scan. Let's just call this folder training. I'm going to go here. Image one. Okay, so we just press F2, took an image. This, the settings when you take an image, you wanna pay attention to, because this is one thing that people will change from one session to the next. So I'm gonna press Control O on the keyboard, or I can also, because uh, taking an image is a scan function, I can come up to scan and look at the preferences. What I wanna do is find, I'm gonna click these little cameras. Okay, F2 is the photo preset. This sets what happens when I press the F2 button. So five microseconds was too short. So I might do 100 microseconds. So now when I press F2, you can see this flashing over here on the left. This little flashing icon indicates where I am in the scan process. There are times that I will acquire an image this slowly if I want a really nice signal to noise ratio. Uh, for the purposes of training, this is painful. So I am going to, just for right now, select this guy. We're going to set this to 30 microseconds. Also, action is what happens at the end of the scan. Some users turn off save as. Some people have it save automatically. Some people have it say none. If it says none, so I say, okay, uh, let me show you. When I press F2, we're gonna have a single frame scan, and then at the end of the scan, it's gonna pause. I'm gonna type in a value. Let's, uh, let's speed it up. No, nope. sorry, I went F2, 15 microseconds, yes, okay. So 
Oops. Okay, doesn't quite like that. Let's try one more time. I'm gonna click the camera icon. We're gonna change this. Oh, that looks like it won't let me. Different software versions let you type the exact number in. So maybe for today we will choose five microseconds. Okay. So when I press F2, we see it's gonna complete a scan. At the end of the scan, it will pause on its own. So pausing just means that the beam is no longer scanning back and forth. Nothing happened. I have to, at this point, remember to click Save As. So if I want, I can go back to that Preferences and just select the Photo Preset, and I'm going to choose Save As as the action. Do choose 16-bit as your acquisition. There is an 8-bit. That only gives you 255 data levels or grade levels. Per pixel, there's no reason to take an 8-bit image anymore. Okay, so now when I press F2, we see the beam scan, flashes, the pause button flashes until it actually is done, and now we can save. Other things to keep in mind are that if you want the data bar, you have to have this checked. And if you want to save the image with overlaid graphics, you also need this checked. Overlaid graphics are things like measurements. If I were to measure these, and somebody left this in cross-section, so let's say no correction. So that's a three micron sphere. If I save my image, and this is not checked, those, those measurements will not be saved. So keep that in mind. And let's Try something just to verify. Where do I think we just save that in my documents? Training. Let's open this last image we took. Okay. Um, I had to check. FEI has a lot of different versions of software. And um, on the Nova, what's good, this yellow cross is not considered an overlay. Some other software packages consider the yellow cross an overlay. And I've been burned before where. I spend all day doing microscopy and then I have a yellow cross right in the middle that I don't want. So uh, on the Nova, don't worry about it. The yellow cross will not show up. Okay, press F6. We can begin scanning again. Let's go a little faster. Right, at this point, I've done my beam alignments. I've set my contrast and brightness. And you can see as I move, um, I need to tweak the focus a little bit. Okay, the Nova is, is our second highest resolution SEM in the facility, but you see that if I come here to even 50,000 X, this is a blurry image. What I need to do is on this toolbar, there is another mode called mode to immersion mode. And that projects a magnetic field in this space between the lens and the sample and allows us to get a much higher resolution image. So if you are interested in ultra high resolution imaging, you have to use immersion mode. You always will set the microscope up in field free mode and then when you're ready for high res, let's go to immersion. It uses a different objective lens, so I have to focus again. And you notice that Hopefully you noticed there was a little bit of swinging when I focus back and forth, so I have to do my lens alignment again. Uh, these are alignments that, that you really should get familiar with. They should not take you more than, more than a minute at most. Check the crossover, looks good. Now let's go back to lens alignment. We see some vertical swinging and some side to side swinging. So I'm moving now up and down in this control panel. A little bit of side to side swing. Let me click here. Got worse, so I go the other way. Okay, so here's good enough for now. And our astigmatism also will need corrected for, so I do our fine focus. 
uh, you see the sample is moving. I'm not moving the stage. Um, means it's kind of charging a little bit. Uh, let's turn the contrast down. Contrast down a little bit. And now let's go back over to one of these regions with the small. Okay, so now we can get a higher resolution image. Still to me, this does not look great if I were interested in really high resolution. And just experience will tell you eventually that the reason why is the probe current is too high. Um, lower probe currents give a noisier image. Higher probe currents give a high signal image. High probe currents give a poor resolution. Low probe currents give a good resolution. Uh, just a rule of thumb. So I'm going to drop down to 98 picoamps. And right, right away, you see, I, I get a little bit of this, this kind of grainy salt and pepper look. Every time I change the beam, I need to check my crossover. I need to check my lens alignment. There, it made it worse. F7 brings up what we call the reduced raster window. I often use this when I'm doing focusing. So now it's, you can see if I change contrast and brightness, it's only scanning in this small square area. So that helps me sometimes just to focus my attention on a small region. I can see some astigmatism in that image. So now, contrast too high. We have a much sharper, higher resolution image. We're at 98 picoamps, um, but that's the ultra high resolution mode. So we kind of, we refer to just different ways. Field free mode, we, you'll hear staff call it mode one or mode two. You'll hear, hear us call it field free or search mode or normal mode. Immersion mode, we sometimes call UHR for ultra high resolution. So if you come to me and I'm in my office and I'm writing an email and you say, hey, I can't get a uh, high, high mag shot. And I say, oh, are you in UHR mode? When you come back and look, you're not going to find that. You'll be like, I don't know. I, I see I'm in immersion mode. So yeah, immersion mode is UHR mode. Okay. One thing to note is that I have a minimum magnification. So I'm turning the, the, the um, knob counterclockwise, but I can't go any lower in mag than 800. So if I come back to field free mode, that's kind of why sometimes we call it search mode because that gives me freedom to go as low as possible. All right, so here, that was some some gold spheres. Um, we do have two detectors on the Nova. Um, they're both secondary electron detectors. All right, so here will be a good indication. Let's do let's do an image here. I'm going to take one image with. Um, so let's call this search mode. And let's, I can actually click to a different quadrant. And actually, let's use this quadrant because we're done with this one. I'm going to say file, open, search mode. Now let's immediately go over to UHR mode, immersion mode, sorry. I'm just going to tweak the focus. Usually when you're imaging, you, you don't switch back and forth between UHR and search quite as often as I am. Uh, a good rule of thumb with electron microscopy is that you want to focus at a higher mag than you take the picture at. So if I wanted to match that image that I took. I took it at 25,000x. 
Um, so I need to focus above 25,000x. So now I drop back down, there's my 25,000, F2. And if we were to compare these two, you can look at a uh, FFT, uh, Fourier transform of this image, and uh, you'll see that the edges are sharper. So F6, F5. This sample is gold on carbon. So I mentioned there are two detectors. There is the ETD and the TLD. The TLD stands for through the lens detector. The ETD stands for Everhart Thornley detector. Um, both can be put in a few different modes, but both generally detect secondary electrons. Um, UHR mode or immersion mode must use the TLD detector, but what's nice is it will automatically cert switch that for you. If I go back to field free mode also, you can see that it switched back for me. So it went back to the ETD. The ETD detector is the traditional SEM detector, uh, secondary electron detector. So um, looking for my focal point, there we go. So when I went back to search mode or mode one, we now are in the Everhart Thornley. You can use the TLD in Everhart Thornley mode, uh, but it's up inside the pole piece. I very rarely found reason to do that, but it is possible to do. So general rule of thumb, search mode is Everhart Thornley. Immersion mode is uh, TLD. So we can move around to various regions. One thing I want to show right now in the center of the stage is a platinum aperture. And uh, you can read right here where it says specimen current. This is the amount of electron current that is coming in the beam, hitting the sample, being absorbed by the sample and making it out the stage. So a lot of that, though, is reduced by the secondary electron yield and backscatter yield. If you have an experiment where you need to know exact dose, what you can do is use a Faraday cup. This is a platinum aperture, so it's got a hole that's very deep and none of the electrons can escape. What's interesting, so if I look at the specimen current now, it says 35 picoamps. When I'm supposed to be getting 100, so that could be a um, alignment that we need to do, maybe. Could be a, honestly, I, I just changed up to 1.6 nanoamp, and I saw no change in that value. That actually tells me this is something we need to call our friendly service engineer about. Okay. Uh, honestly, it's not, not too vital of a thing, it's just something I was hoping to show. Okay. So what I just did is I changed the current up to 1.6 nanoamp. You can see I've got a way brighter image. I have a lot more signal. A high current image is going to be worse resolution. Um, so if we look at that same sort of magnification, so here we're at 25,000 X and this is, this is going to be about as good as I can do. Um, so yeah, this high, high current is generally for analytical work for EDS. Uh, we don't have an EBSD detector here, but we do have an EDS detector. So, um, you want to use high current for EDS. I'm not going to show EDS today. What I want to do now is I'm going to go to, we have a sample on here that is a silicon there's a TEM grid, another TEM grid. Here we go. This is a silicon alignment sample. Uh, we often use it for testing functions of the focused ion beam. 
uh, I'm going to use it to set what we call eucentric height. For standard SEM imaging, you don't really need to set eucentric height, but for FIBUS you do, so I'd like to go ahead and talk about it. Um, one thing you notice right now is everything's kind of inclined. I have this nifty feature up here in the stage dropdown called XT, it's just the name of their software, XT Align Feature. Let's make the feature horizontal, and it says click in the image to specify the first point, so I'll click here. Let's click in the image to specify the second point, click there, finish. And now the microscope is going to do an, a rotation for me. See, it's not perfect, so let me do it again. Okay, so now it's pretty orthogonal. This is going to help me for setting eucentric height. Tweak my focus. Okay, I look good there. To set eucentric height, pick a feature. My feature I've chosen is going to be this edge, this bottom edge of this pattern silicon cross, and I've aligned it perfectly with the yellow. Um, I'm, I'm interested really in only the horizontal axis. I don't care that the vertical axis is not aligned. I am going to do this in quadrant mode, so you can see here in the CCD the the beam movements. Nominal eucentric height, and eucentric is just a word, it's a Greek word that just means well-centered. Um, what we're actually doing, the stage has a tilt axis, and the sample x value happens after the tilt axis. So if my sample is below the tilt axis, when I tilt the stage and I'm imaging here, the area that I'm imaging moves. And but if I can get my sample right on the tilt axis, the area that I'm imaging doesn't move when I tilt. So that's what we want. We want eucentric height or just well-centered height. Uh, so we're going to align the z-axis with the tilt axis of the stage. To get in the ballpark, I'm going to type in 10, and what we're going to see is this cross is going to move up or down. So we see it moved up. And when that happens, let's do this. I'm going to roll over to the stage. I'm going to grab the Z knob and I'm going to turn it down. So the sample moved up. I need to move Z down. And I want to bring that horizontal line back to the yellow cross. Okay, so I go back to zero tilt, and I see my sample there again. That got me in the ballpark. This time I'm going to go up to 52. 52 degrees is the standard ion imaging tilt. Uh, you see my mouse here showing this conical pole piece. This is the ion beam pole piece. So when you're at 52 degrees, this is um, perpendicular to the ion beam. My sample again moved up pretty far. Turn the contrast up. So again, I need to move it down. I'm gonna go back to zero tilt. You can see uh, the tilt mechanism moving on the stage image there, um, so the whole tilt mechanism moves. So essentially what you get when you're at eucentric height is that when you change the stage tilt, a feature you're interested in doesn't move, you don't lose it. If for some odd reason I was interested in this piece of junk here, now if I were to tilt to 45 degrees, that, that debris doesn't move in my field of view. So effectively, again, what I've done here is I've moved the sample up and down. So we have the tilt axis at the stage. I've moved the sample up and down to be coincident with the tilt axis. That's what eucentric height is. Critical when you do focused ion beam work, especially because you want to be able to look at 
the sample with both the focused ion beam and the electron beam. Um, you know, I wasn't really planning on looking at FIB just for fun. Let's turn the FIB beam on. And what we should hopefully see, I'm going to turn the voltage up to 30 kV, the beam intensity or, or beam current down to uh, point, uh, no, I want probably 50 picoamp. Uh, the ion beam is destructive, so I don't, as I image, I will be destroying the sample in some manner. But you can see here, here again is that, that feature. If I now go up to 52 degrees, that feature stays centered. So eucentric height is critical for focused ion beam work because what happens is you change back and forth from electron beam to uh, SEM beam and you also tilt up and down quite a bit. So that is eucentric height. We can see we've got the same feature here that we have over here in the electron beam image. Go ahead and turn off the ion beam. I'm going to go back. Control E is a keyboard shortcut that will take you back to zero degree tilt. Uh, I mentioned that the ion beam uh, tilt is 52 degrees. Control I for ion beam will tilt you up to 52. Control E will tilt you down to zero. So it's, it's just a convenient shortcut. Um, I am going to show now, if we, let's look at the, the processing page. I'm going to bring up a line measurement. And if I measure from here, oops, not the feature I wanted to do. There's, sorry, I didn't select this. Now it's selected, so I should be able to. I'm going to measure from the left pitch of this over to the right pitch. And what's interesting, I'm really glad I did this, um, this should be within 3%. So right now it should be reading... Uh, Obviously, it's a 100 micron patterned wafer. Uh, this should say 100.0. If it said 97 to 103, you're within industry standard. Honestly, we can align it within 1%, so it should be between, you know, even a half percent, 99.5 to 100.5. Uh, this is a service alignment I will do offline afterwards. Um, but you can do measurements. You can also do measurements in image J, which really I... I suggest just take your images, use the data bar to calibrate your images and do them offline. I'm going to find one more sample and here it is. Um, so this is great. This is a piece of plastic. This is what electron beam charging looks like. Um, so we're kind of dramatically causing skewing of the image. I'm going to go up to 30 kV. I don't suggest you do this, but for demonstration purposes, this will be great. So what I'm doing is imaging this, and let me go down in, in mag a little bit. Um, you can actually see what looks like a shrinking, and then it's actually charging and then discharging. The, the voltage is getting high enough on the surface there that it's arcing to ground somewhere. Let's see, am I... Close enough, let me get near the center. I was pretty much near the center of that. Okay, because what I want to do is now we've charged up quite a bit. I'm going to go down to 2 kV. And we can make the beam do a U-turn. So what's happening right now, and I'm going to Scan that and pause it. So the, my sample, I scanned with 30 kV, and I was building up a very high uh, equipotential field, just a static electric field on the sample because I'm pumping electrons in it, and it had no way to go because it's an insulator. So I probably charged up to about 30 kV. I dropped the beam down to 2 kV, so the beam comes and then actually gets repelled by the sample, and now we're scanning it on the interior of the microscope. So I want to show a couple things. Of course, you've got this bad fisheye distortion, so ignore that. Um, we have some stuff on the pole piece. 
it's really critical that you guys pay attention to proper sample handling. Every one of these bits are going to be parts of someone's sample that they didn't adhere well. Uh, some people use for the thermoplastic mounts for polishing samples, they put nickel powder in it. Nickel is magnetic, and when you use these high magnetic fields, it will suck the nickel directly up and stick it to the column. Some people put powders in our microscope, and they aren't very careful about, you should have a single layer of powder. You shouldn't have a large uh, pile of it. So when they hit pump, the powder just goes everywhere. Um, so please, if you, if you don't know the best way to um, prep your sample, let us know and we will um, help you prep your sample. It's kind of interesting, just like regular imaging, I can move around. So somebody's sample is here, kind of charging up. We have some sample on the inside. These all are sources of astigmatism. Um, just I'll show you kind of quickly some of the other areas. This gridded area is the secondary electron detector. Uh, if I turn the brightness way down, uh, interesting. So this tells me there's a dark region in it. Um, that means our scintillator probably is a little burnt. Um, so good to know. We will fix that. Um, contrast down, brightness up. Hard to see, but, but these are gas injectors here. This is the ion column. There's another one here. Uh, this is our omniprobe, I believe. And this is the EDS detector. So just a, a kind of fisheye view of the electron microscope by flipping the beam around. So what I'm gonna do now is um, show, okay, we're done with the session. We want to break down. Uh, we've done a couple things. So we, we saved some images. I'm going to minimize here. Obviously, standard Windows desktop. There is, or should be, a folder here called Nova Temporary User Data. Um, this is on the microscope that's directly to, or the, sorry, computer that's directly to my left. You want to save your images there. We saved them today for training. Just put them in my documents in this training folder. What I should do is move all these over to the temporary user data folder. That computer has a connection to our file server, so you can send your images up to our file server. Please don't leave images on our microscope um, because eventually we're going to have to delete them, you know, and we don't want to feel bad if we delete data that that's pretty vital. So back your data up. Think of our server as it's kind of like a courtesy to allow you to easily transfer large amounts of data. It's not an archive server. You should handle the archive of your own data in your own lab. Um, so once you download your data from our server, please delete it. Our servers get very full very quickly. Uh, so if you do your part and delete it, that helps us out. So I want to transfer my data. I'm going to come back here. I should probably leave in quad mode. I want to make sure you can pause the CCD image. Make sure it's unpaused. The next user may not pay attention and they may think that they're okay and they slap the sample against the pole piece. The stage we can set to zero, zero. Again, that's just kind of good courtesy because most people will load their sample in the middle. Z doesn't matter because when I vent the stage, it's going to drop Z. So I'm going to click, click vent. It says, please confirm specimen chamber vent so you don't accidentally vent it while imaging. Uh, are you sure you want to continue? I click yes, and then you'll see the sample drop. What I'm actually going to do... Um, is I'm going to pump back down really quick and just just again quickly go through the initial beam setup. Uh, maybe I'll pick a different beam value. Um, I honestly wanted to vent the chamber just to dissipate some of that charge I built up. 
but you'll open the chamber door, take your sample out, close the chamber door just like you did when you started your session and then pump it down. You wanna leave the chamber under vacuum at all times. It keeps it from getting um, saturated with humidity and the, the vacuum degrading, et cetera. It keeps hydrocarbons out of the chamber. So uh, make sure you close the door and pump it down. You wanna make sure that it pumps all the way down before you leave. That way it doesn't vent and you know spend all night at atmosphere. Okay, so we're gonna just pretend like I pulled my sample out. I'm gonna click pump. That's given us actually long enough and enough atmosphere went into the chamber to dissipate that charge that I built up. So what I'm gonna do is quickly just um, align the beam. I'm just gonna set eucentric height really quick, do my beam alignments, do my stigmation, set my contrast and brightness, just so you guys can see. Uh, right now it says it's 230, so we'll see how long it takes. Shouldn't be very long at all. Uh, if we look at these icons here while we're waiting again, this one at the top is the electron column pressure gauge. This one on the left is the ion column pressure uh, indicator. If those are ever gray or orange, let a staff member know. It means there's been a hardware malfunction and it requires service. Uh, you know, normally this, this guy here, well, it goes orange every time that you pump down or vent. Um, but if the column indicators are anything other than green, you need to let us know right away. Occasionally the electron beam will turn itself off. This is a field emission gun. It's a shot key field emitter. The emitter runs 24 seven. This one's probably been running for years without um, interruption. If this green bar, what we see green here is not, you know, if it's red, if it's gray, again, let us know something's gone wrong. We need to start the emitter back up. In the drop down menus, we have the option of recording movies. Sometimes you have a dynamic experiment. We can again select detectors. We have different scan functions. We have the video scope I showed, the reduced area. We can also put the beam into a spot mode if we're doing say EDS or something. Uh, or with the ion beam, sometimes you wanna just drill holes and you do that with spot mode. These are the scan speed functions, same found here in the toolbar. Uh, we have some line integration, scan interlacing. Uh, I'm not really gonna talk about those right now. They're, they're sort of advanced imaging techniques that even if you think you've aligned your beam as well as you can, but you still have charging, you still have problems, uh, you don't wanna coat your sample and you have charging, we might be able to come up with a beam parameter or a scan parameter that lets us image. We have a scan rotation function. I will show you that in a second. Here we can select which beam we're looking at. Patterning is for fib. S the stage function. So here we have the align feature that gives us the ability to do horizontal or vertical alignments. There is importantly here a home stage function. You don't need to home the stage when you're done with your session. Home doesn't mean go back to zero, zero. Home means go to the far limits, find the limits, and then recalculate zero, zero. So stage homing is done when there's an error, something has happened. So if you come in and for some reason the automatic stage movements don't work, um, you might need to home the stage. In the tool function, we have just some various things, displaying saturation, a movie creator. And then finally, uh, we can turn that center cross off if we want. I like to keep it there. Help has a uh, documentation. So the whole, you can find the whole um, manual here. If you're curious, let us know. We have it saved offline and you don't have to sit at the microscope and, and use it. Okay, while I'm waiting, I'm gonna say, you know what, let's do 10 kV, and I'm gonna do a 130 picoamp beam. That way when, as soon as the vacuum is okay, I'm ready to go. So if you're attending this training for, to satisfy the initial training requirement, please email um, Deanna Wendell, our department administrator. Let her know that you attended the training. 
Uh, you can also just leave a comment. So I see Jeremy's left a number of comments. So we'll make sure that your access to the tool is granted. Um, so of course, staff is here every day. We don't expect you to perfectly be able to operate the microscope after watching this uh, training session, but hopefully this will get you started. All right, we see this uh, just about ready to go. Four to the minus six, so this should turn green. It says 235 is the time. So I'm gonna drive back over and find those 10 spheres. There we go. Let's do a little faster scan. Okay, image gets worse. I go through the focal point, gets worse again. I'm gonna come back into some, some middle value. Link the stage. Go here and choose 5.0, only after I've verified that I'm nominally in focus. The sample has just moved up to five millimeter. Now I can zoom up and do it again. Okay, now there's my middle focal point. Let's go back to the control panel, check the crossover, looks good. Let's do our lens alignment. And it's actually pretty good, but if it weren't, you know, if we were way out here, it should only take you a few minutes at most to align this. So I take one axis and you see I'm removing the vertical, vertical movement, leaving only horizontal movement. If I go too far, it starts to go diagonally the opposite direction. So it's pretty easy to tell when you've got one axis corrected. Now I'm gonna grab this slider and there's a little bit more vertical. Okay, lens alignment is good. Let's double click. Do F7 to focus our attention. Find decent focal point that I can use to correct astigmatism. So I'm looking at this one feature and now I'll correct astigmatism Y. Okay, correct X. Just like focus, I go through, gets blurry and worse. I go through the good point, back to the other side iterate looks good drop in magnification maybe do f3 yep my contrast is way too high so i'm going to drop contrast down turn the brightness up a little bit now i'm operating or or occupying that good 80 to 20 percent and it's uh so i started at 234 it's now 237 it took me a a uh, grand total of three minutes to go from back okay to having a fully aligned beam and every all my parameters set okay. So uh, it's not gonna, you're not gonna be able to do it that quickly when you first start, but eventually with a lot of experience, you should be able to. And if you find that it's continually taking you, you know, 30 minutes to align the beam, just ask us to sit down with you and, and help you out, and we will do that. So this is basic SEM imaging. So hopefully, my hope is that what you can do is, let's see, do we still have this? Oh, we don't have the lab notes open. Tool, did it? Yep, remembered our notes. So hopefully, you can kind of run through these procedures. You log into FOM to start your reservation, vent the microscope, put your gloves on, uh, load your sample and check the height with the elephant. Close the door and pump it down. We want you to turn the electron beam on with this beam on button. Um, and one thing I'll say is 6A. Unpause the electron beam. Um, even myself, a number of times, I, I change the contrast and brightness. Nothing's happening. I'm like, oh, I forgot to unpause. Or... I've worked for a couple minutes and realized I didn't turn the beam on. After finding the region of interest, uh, we want to do a coarse focus to link the Z to working distance. 
Then we very quickly go through this iterative step of adjusting crossover, doing a little bit of fine focus, doing a lens alignment, then going back and fine focus and stigmation correction. Finally set my contrast and brightness and take an image. And that should just take you a couple minutes. So I'll close that up. Uh, nope, don't need to save it. Last thing I'm gonna do is one more time, again, set eucentric height. Because again, that's a pretty straightforward step. I'm gonna try to avoid that piece of plastic. And here is our silicon grid. You can use anything to set eucentric height. It doesn't have to be some perfect feature. Uh, this is a pit that was a TEM lift out. Because I've moved to a vastly different area, I do one more time when a relink. That way I know this says, okay, I'm at 5.3. Let me go to 5.0. And this is a pretty noisy image, so I'm gonna slow down that scan just a little bit. But I have the bottom of this pit lined up with the horizontal line of my cross. Go to 10 degrees. Okay, back to zero degrees, and I'll double click one more time. So I always do this zero to 10, zero to 52. So now, just in case I'm really far off eucentric, if you go straight from zero to 52, sometimes your feature just marches right off screen and you lose it. So that's why 10 degrees, it's not gonna move quite as much. So again, setting you centric height, it's a vital step if you're gonna do focused IM beam work and it should take you no more than a minute or two. Um, so. And as a rule of thumb, if you're gonna image up to probably 50,000 X, field free is okay. If you're going to use immersion mode, um, then you'll be able to get up to you know, 250, 400,000 X, depending on your sample. Um, so that's it. I'm going to go ahead and now vent the stage, vent the chamber, sorry, and remove the sample. Let's go to F5. You see that? As a courtesy, we move back to zero, zero. That way somebody is pretty sure they'll be able to find their sample. In the room, I don't know if the mic is picking it up, but you can hear the turbo pump spinning down. So you'll hear this kind of high-pitched whine sound. That's okay, it doesn't mean anything's malfunctioning. It's just the turbo pump spinning down, the vacuum pump. And again, we're going to um, just kind of tug on the door until it opens up, but you don't need to really pull on it hard. Let's go here. So again, I'm wearing gloves, um, brand new gloves. Please don't reuse gloves. It's too easy to flip them inside out and then you just end up contaminating the microscope. Way worse than if you wore no gloves whatsoever. So I'm just giving kind of a light tug on the door. I'm not really, you know, I'm not using any muscle power, just kind of tugging a little bit. Eventually, once the uh, pressure equilibrates with the room, the door should be able just to slide open.
I guess while we're waiting, I can just point out a couple things. Uh, this, this here is the Omniprobe. Uh, here you can see the focused ion beam. With, this is the AVA, the Automated Variable Aperture. So this is what we call a beam-defining aperture. So the ion column emits at a fixed value, and we change the current based on what size hole we put between the emission point and your sample. Uh, over here, this is a gas injector, so we can do some deposition. If you're interested in doing focus ion beam work on the NOVA, uh, we can do another training on that for lamella prep. So again, I'm holding onto the door, letting it open gently. Make sure that your samples are clean. Uh, wearing gloves doesn't really help you if your samples are not stored well. So your samples should always be clean, stored well. Um, otherwise, you're going to get bad contamination in your image, and that can cause a problem for other people as well. Just like before, I hold the door. I click pump. And I just wait long enough that tugging on the door doesn't open it. Okay, guys, uh, appreciate it. Thank you for signing on. Um, send Deanna an email. Let her know that you attended the training, and we will get your Helio or your sorry Nova access set up. And if uh, you have questions, I'm I'm in the lab almost every day. Um, all staff members should be able to help you out. So if you need help, just come find us and uh, we should be able to, to answer whatever question you have. Um, make sure when you're done with your session that you log out of FOM. That lets the next user know that you're done. It also stops your billing. And um, also do remember to log into FOM, although the computer monitor should not power on until you've logged in. Um, if you have any questions, you can always email me. You can find us at uh, mc2.engine.umich. Uh, that's where our website is. And all of our email addresses, uh, all staff email addresses are there if you need to contact us. Or you can just come knock on my door. Uh, I'm always here in Building 22. So thanks for joining. And uh, come let me know.